this kind of activity is, in my mind, right smack dab at the center of what a great research university is all about. Research universities have come to play a role in our society that is fundamental to so many things that are the drivers of social and economic and cultural, as well as educational change. Probably many of you here are readers of The Economist. If you're not, you might want to pick up this week's edition of The Economist. They have their, their regular annual survey of higher education in it, where they continue the themes of Tom Friedman and all the others about the critical nature of education and universities, and especially research universities. And in it, they also talk about the dominance of American universities and how American universities have been this huge competitive advantage for the United States over the past 50 or 60 years or so. And at the heart of what they're really talking about is what this symposium is about. And that is developing innovation in ways that serves society around us, that moves those innovations out of our laboratories, out of our classrooms, out of our studios, out into society where it can have some consequential impact. And that impact can be either in direct technology transfer into businesses, what this symposium is about. It can be transforming the lives of students who walk into our institutions, spend three, four, five, sometimes six years as undergraduates, however long they're here with, as graduate students, but leave our places fundamentally changed, their lives heading in completely different directions, directions that probably they couldn't foretell when they walked onto our campuses. They are indeed transformed by that experience in ways that have powerful, meaningful impacts on the society around them. That's what great universities do. What you're here to talk about that I'm really pleased with is, in fact, how can we accelerate that process? How can we accelerate not just the development of new ideas, but also the movement of ideas along that value chain, as our business colleagues here would say, from idea to impact? And as the leader of a university, in all candor, I'm personally as interested in the non-business impacts as the business impacts. But the business impacts wind up being these critical drivers of so much of the rest of the health of our country and indeed our planet, that you can't not pay attention to them. We cannot at the University of Washington or any other great university not be focused on those impacts because that's, again, what we do. That's what really is the measure of success in my book. This is also the time of year where university presidents and deans spend a fair amount of time looking at rankings, because all the rankings are coming out. This is the ranking sweepstake. It's like the, uh, the TV sweeps week. You know, the US News and World Report came out, and uh, as I mentioned, The Economist came out with their rankings, and the Washington Review now has a new set of rankings, and everybody's coming out with rankings. But the fact is, we're all, we're all proud of the, oh, and then there's the football rankings. We don't pay a lot of attention to those. <laughs> but but, the, but the, the, you know, the, the fact that we're, we move around and hopefully up in rankings is a good thing. And I'm really pleased that when The Economist came up with their, their list of, of the 20 most important universities on the planet, that we were on that list. That's a great place to be. We want to be on those lists. But that's not what really counts, of course. Those are just sort of meaningless numbers that or the uh, summation of somebody's interesting algorithm about what makes up a great university. The pieces that are much, much, much harder to measure are indeed our capacity to create futures and to transform people's lives. We can see it. We know it when we see it. We can count those experiences, but it's bloody hard to turn that into some kind of ranking. That's what you're here to talk about, though. How do we improve that chain? How do we make that happen faster? How do we know it when we see it? How do we get things in and out of our universities in ways that are going to impact people's lives? I'm delighted that you're here. Delighted that you're willing to spend two days on this effort. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the university. My name is David Croson. I'm a faculty member at the Cox School of Business at Southern Methodist University. I'd like to give you uh, just a perspective on how we design the symposium some of the key organizing ideas behind what we're thinking of in terms of capabilities of the new technology, uh, and to give you a little bit of creative inspiration, ranging from some uh, business and political histories to some description of uh, technologies that you might think are science fiction but are indeed uh, business fact now. Uh, so first, I'd like to uh, just give you an overview of our assets. You might think of this as the asset side of our balance sheet. 
Uh, we have approximately 100 experts here, and uh, we have you bound by the uh, bonds of your own curiosity to provide your intellect to our service for the next couple of days, and we intend to use that asset as much as we possibly can. Uh, many of you have uh, expertise in things which we might think of as relatively far flung away from what an entrepreneur would be doing in a startup today. And some of you really have some hands-on experience with what it takes in order to put together a technology prototype, get your first customer, et cetera. Uh, these fields range, as you see, uh, from business to drama, which was about as, uh, as broad a range as I could possibly imagine. And we have hopefully artfully arranged you in balanced squads and teams so that we don't actually have critical mass of any one ability in any one lumpy place. We try to spread people out so that uh, we'll have faculty from business schools, working with faculty from information schools, working with doctoral students from computer science departments, working with a practitioner from industry, uh, so that we don't end up having all of the people from the ivory tower on the same teams and all the people who are going to sneak out at lunch and do a startup on the same teams. Uh, we are, of course, uh, physically located in one of the nation's top idea factories. Uh, not only do we have lots of technology to support us, which comes from you know, every century uh, from the past three, I guess, you know, everything from chalk to wireless internet connectivity, uh, but we also have all sorts of space and, of course, munchies and coffee in order to keep us going during the next 48 hours or so. Um, I will be talking about uh, an intellectual framework, which I hope will get you thinking about applications of some of these new technologies, but still give you room to thrash around a little bit without having our assumptions about how you're going to work predetermine the outcome. Uh, there's a famous uh, set of research papers in the optimal design of organizations, which talks about the importance of leaving slack resources. If you have an organization which is designed, in order to have every person there be busy all the time, to never actually have any free time at all, the good news is, I suppose, from an optimal design perspective, you have full utilization, and that organization is accomplishing as much as it possibly could under the constraints of what you had originally envisioned that they do. It may be perfectly designed for one particular task. The trouble is, since there's no slack in these resources, there's no opportunity for that organization to ever learn or get better at what it does you need to actually leave a few spare resources so that some tinkering can happen. And Rob gave us an example of Sun Microsystems where that tinkering actually led to a little toy which led to a game which led to a whole change in core strategy. And we hope to, in addition to creating some of the expected linkages which are built into the types of capabilities that we've put in the framework, we hope to find out stuff that we never could have anticipated. I'm really looking forward to being surprised by unexpected linkages that the other 99 people who have subject uh, matter expertise are going to come up with. It's those unexpected link which, linkages, I firmly believe, which leads to the next generation of killer applications, things that nobody ever thought to put together before. Okay? So our goal for the symposium design is to have an interesting discussion, hopefully that will lead to others. We hope to get some unexpected good ideas. Please you know, don't limit yourself to things that you know are going to be good ideas. Take a risk that you're not gambling with anybody's money, not your own, not venture capitalist money, nobody's. You know, we're purely at the idea stage. Uh, we hope to get an idea of how the creative process happened for these ideas. We've asked doctoral students scribes in order to keep track of what ideas were proposed and which ones took root and which ones generated discussions and which ones sort of died off. Uh, in the middle, but at the end of the day, our goal is to really accelerate the gestation of ideas which lead to one or more billion dollar business ideas. Right now, practically all of the ideas you'll be thinking of are in the zero billion dollar stage. However, there's a big benefit to getting these billion dollar businesses launched six weeks earlier, six months earlier, or six years earlier. Uh, we don't want them to come out of the incubator half-baked or prematurely, of course. We just like to kind of get on with the conception process, if you will, so that their birthday can be moved up a little bit on the calendar. And so these businesses might be born in January instead of being born in July. I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story about President William McKinley in the 1901 World's Fair in Buffalo, New York. So William McKinley was uh, campaigning for election. Uh, he arrived relatively late at the World's Fair in September. It's a summer event. And he made a stump speech on September the 5th, 1901, talking about the importance of convocations and symposia. And he said, basically, getting together in expositions uh, is a good thing. They keep track of what's actually happening in the economy. They record the world's advancements. They stimulate energy. They quicken human genius. They lead to innovations which go into the home. They broaden the life of the people. And they create inspiration for the student. And those of you in the doctoral student scribe role should have that resonate with you. Uh, you'll notice that this was uh, 
uttered, I don't know, 104 years and a week ago at this point. And uh, Bill McKinley is actually a distant relative of mine on my mother's side, so you'll see that I take the most important thing that happened at the World's Fair in Buffalo in 1901 pretty seriously. I thought this was pretty interesting. A speech given on September 5. On September 6, 1901, William McKinley was shot twice in the chest by Leon Salgaz, an anarchist, uh, and he was taken to the medical pavilion of the World's Fair, where doctors frantically searched around in his torso for two bullets. They recovered one. They couldn't find the other one. They looked and looked and looked. He was weakening. They didn't know what to do, so they sewed him back up. They sent him back on the train to Washington, where he died. The incredible irony of the fact that this occurred at the 1901 World's Fair was that the 1901 World's Fair also was the debut of a very important piece of medical information technology, the X-ray machine. It was on display in that same medical pavilion where President McKinley was stretched out with people probing around with old-fashioned 19th century devices looking for this stray bullet. Nobody actually thought that the X-ray machine would be useful in this application. It wasn't that the technology wasn't known, it wasn't that the infrastructure wasn't there. Literally, he was 10 feet away from it. But nobody said, gee, maybe we should put this on the president and see what we could find out. That's an example of lack of information, communication between the people who know about the technology and the people who know about the application managing to get together at a certain critical time. And I think you would argue that you know, being just a few days earlier on putting together the technology and the application would have made a major difference uh, in US history. So, how do we propose to accomplish some of these chance coincidences today and maybe speed things up in a great uh, way? The goal is not necessarily to innovate something and to create it this week or even this month or this year, but to say it would be, it would come to fruition and be a billion dollar business at time X plus six months and we're gonna make it come about at time X instead. The time value of innovation can be very large in terms of the economic activity which is created by a new technological boom, in terms of the salaries and the well-being of the people who work in it, in terms of the better application of these technologies going forward. Okay, uh, let me briefly go through each of these capabilities. Nothing is ever lost. This is something which could be accomplished by a combination of enabling technologies and applications. And basically when we talk about the uh, application of nothing is ever lost, we'd like to know where things are. In particular, we need for every object to know where it itself is and to be able to tell us, here's where I am. Theoretically, we could know the location of any object or its status, if you will, its health, whether the battery on my laptop is uh, you know, fully charged or at 10% critical level, talking about an object or obviously the health of a human being, if we wanted to. We don't necessarily want to have every piece of information just bombarding us. We want to be able to pay attention to the ones only that we care about. Uh, one item that I think might start off a discussion is, if you know where everything is, it might be possible to reassign ownership or the right to direct that object or to enjoy the fruits of it among people without actually having to move the object. It might be possible for me, for example, to you know, temporarily get the use of a car, which happens to be parked in space 136D in one of the university lots, right, to pay somebody and to be able to drive their car for 6.2 hours Right, and have them feel like they were completely in control of the process the whole time. I'd really like to have that uh, ability in order to be able to rent pieces of capital equipment for short periods of time, but there are understandable reasons why those markets don't exist now. And you may want to talk about uh, what it would mean in order to pass an act called no object left behind. Not only does that mean you know, no objects left behind when you move, as I recently uh, moved house, but also the idea that no object necessarily has to become technologically obsolete. You may have objects which are able to download updates to their own firmware and to grow with the times in order to evolve into things that they were not originally designed to do. Okay, so these are just some, you know, some points to start off discussions of nothing is ever lost. Second capability, awareness of context and intelligence at the edge. Well, awareness of context is pretty self-explanatory. The objects and hopefully the people who own these objects are aware not only of who they are, you know, and what they are and where they are, but what's actually happening around them. Uh, some of us have not graduated to this level of environmental awareness, even as human organisms, and so it's unrealistic to expect that our PDA will necessarily have this property. But it seems at least possible to name a few types of intelligence at the edge that these technologies might have. Not only would they know where they are, which is sort of related to nothing is ever lost, 
but they might also know some, some potential other objects that they could transact with. So think, for example, about the Bluetooth technology, which is able to notice who it can communicate with within its uh, transmission radius, or a wireless access card in your PC, which is able to notice wireless networks that it can actually grapple with and get a signal. Right? We're starting to see applications of that. It would also be nice in order to have these objects know, you know who or what it's competing with and what might be a good thing for it to be doing. Right? My, uh, computer through IBM Access Connections is able to notice that there's a wireless network and it knows that I probably want to connect to that, right? How could we extend that to just a little bit more intelligence built into uh, some relatively inexpensive pieces of equipment? Uh, and also, what's something that might be bad for it? Um, you know, as you can tell, I love my, uh, my ThinkPad. It has a little sensor in it which says, oh gee, my owner has just suddenly dropped me off of the table. And so it notices that it's feeling a little bit dizzy. It decides that it's in free fall. It automatically parks the hard drive. Now I have to tell you, I don't know whether this feature works. It's heavily advertised, <laughs> but I've not actually tested it on my ThinkPad and don't get any ideas. But it would be good, it would be really, really good if especially expensive and delicate objects were able to do very basic things to defend themselves against threats which are likely to arise in their environment. Uh, it would also be nice if we had intelligence at the edge, if we could distribute processing power and decision rights so that when one particular object noticed that something was happening, it could do something about it. It could do something more intelligent than simply beaming this information back to central headquarters and hopefully getting a response. There are all sorts of stories from the history of military blunders about information which was known to units who were in the thick of things who had to wait an obscenely long time in order to send that information back to central command and then get orders by which time uh, the battle was already done. It would also be nice if the system weren't vulnerable to a disruption because of a catastrophic event at a central point. Uh, I understand that the uh, metropolitan area of Los Angeles suffered a catastrophic blackout yesterday, uh, which was caused by a relatively localized phenomenon. That was undoubtedly extremely inconvenient for the millions of people in the greater Los Angeles SMSA. It would be really nice if some of those major catastrophes could be contained so that they only knocked out 10% of the power. We tend to focus on, you know, try, we try to focus on perfect solutions. But in this case, the best really is the enemy of the good. Maybe we should be thinking more like stewards and saying, could we have something which is good enough that it will cut off this cascading failure when LA is only five or 10% blacked out rather than going all the way? Uh, massive global innovation. Uh, as you might guess, this says the design innovation process can draw content from practically everywhere. Not only knowing what's going on within our firm, but knowing who else might be our partners, being able to consult freelancers who might be area experts in the area, uh, to think about how we could cooperate with people that we would normally be competitive rivals with, right? Ask ourselves, what do our competitors do particularly well and would they be interested in a side venture which might make us both better off? Uh, and, you know, potentially stirring up new players in the mix. Uh, it's interesting that we start off with our firm. The problem of making a company-wide directory of people's abilities is something which has been talked about now for 20 plus years, but there are relatively few organizations who have done a good job at it. I know that Boeing was one of the first organizations to create a company-wide directory which not only listed where people were, but what they actually knew about and what they could do. And I would guess that if we could measure the return on investment from that company directory, it's just astronomical in terms of percentage return on the time that was spent put in. It would be nice if you, we had things which were demanded in very small quantities spread out over large uh, areas of the world where somebody would be able to figure out that there was indeed a demand for a particular kind of heart medication, for example. 10 people needed it in the US and 10 people needed it in Gambia. And be able to add these up and say, gee, it would be worth actually running a batch, which would be manufactured in London and then send it out to disparate places. And hopefully new products will arrive constantly. A real-time global collaboration. We'd like for people and their associated objects to be able to work together seamlessly. We'd like for them to be able to share information without worries about formats. And hopefully this information that people need to share ought to be available to anybody who gets value out of using it. I know there are some uh, entrepreneurs in the audience who have thought very carefully about how to price these flows of information. This is something which is not necessarily a technological problem so much as it is an economic design problem. But we can think about enabling technologies and also things that have to happen before these markets can be created. We'd like for geography to create options for us rather than constraints. 
Whenever I travel, I bring with me a shopping list of stuff which happens to be expensive at home and cheap where I'm going, and I try to bring home a suitcase full of it uh, if it's you know, reasonable and legal. Um, and this has uh, produced a lot of, th this has produced a lot of interesting stuff. I don't actually resell it so much as then use it in the household. But it's produced a lot of interesting stuff, including being able, for example, to successfully uh, you know, smuggle DRAM chips into Switzerland, which you wouldn't think would normally be you know, a controversial thing because they cost you know, four times as much there as they did when I was in Korea. Uh, and you know, we have overcome geography in order to have this symposium happen at all. There are some of us who are still facing travel delays uh, caused by having to use the uh, somewhat inefficient airline system to get to Seattle. We'd like for the fact that people are in different locations to be a good thing so that you can call on somebody who happens to be where you need them to be rather than having it be a constraint where you say you can't actually do anything with people who are not in the same room with you. I know that this sounds like a problem which has been solved to some extent, but I would argue it really hasn't. We have lots of technologies which partially accomplish this, but I don't know that any of, this, any of us have had the ultimate geography as an option, not as a constraint experience yet. And if you have, I'd love to hear about it when I come around to visit your squad. Uh, finally, build anything anywhere. The idea that physical objects are manufactured in mass quantities in centralized locations and then get distributed out through supply chains, I would say is a very you know, 20th century kind of idea. It may be the case that people who are designing new products have the capability of making prototypes and even doing production runs practically anywhere they happen to be located. It may be the case that the capability of manufacturing these things can be moved around the earth virtually. You don't actually necessarily have to move a 200,000 pound piece of equipment in order to move the capability of creating a particular printed circuit board. You may just be able to reprogram the capital which is already in place. Uh, and I know I've been reading a bunch of provocative articles recently about the ultimate home workshop where you can download something of the 21st century equivalent of a sewing pattern, feed it to your uh, home manufacturing facility, put in the right amounts of raw ingredients, press run, and have it print you or sew you or stitch you or melt you or um, you know, weld you, whatever it is that you happen to need. This is a technology which was originally uh, designed for space missions where it's incredibly inconvenient to go 300,000 miles away only in order to decide that you, you know, need an extra spare part for the thruster. Uh, but as I understand, uh, some scientists have now put together a working prototype of these things which can make 100 seemingly unrelated items on demand uh, simply by downloading the instructions to do it and having it perform a series of 20 fully automatable machinery technologies. It's mostly being used for making electronics parts now, but that may actually change. Okay? Uh, let me extend the analogy of military science leading uh, civilian technology to just give you a, a case example of this type of thinking which was published in 1999 uh, in a study called Reducing the Logistics Burden for the Army After Next, Doing More with, ne more with Less. At this point, we can see that even a modest improvement in military intelligence would yield large returns in areas like cost savings, effectiveness of deployment, uh, you know, right, obviously saving of lives, and also you know, accomplishing goals. It's become a large focus of the productization that we were talking about before at these technologies to enable decision makers at the, the hot spot, if you will, to take local information, to be able to make decisions on the spot, a la army of one, rather than having to send it by carrier pigeon back to the Pentagon and, back to the Pentagon and then uh, get their answer back from the E-ring, you know, minutes, days, weeks, or months later. That information can be particularly valuable. It's supported by a bunch of different types of technologies. Some of these technologies are peer-to-peer -peer communications among, for example, soldiers or units who are on the same battlefield. And some of them are centralized, right? It's aggregation of information which is beamed up to a, you know, a satellite, for example, which is then analyzed in a remote location. And then only small amounts of information are distributed based on a need to know basis to the people who are actually making the decisions. There are a ton of enabling technologies which make this happen. The purpose of this 1999 study was to minimize the weight and the volume of the logistical burden of supporting military operations, which by their nature are basically physical. You have to move a huge amount of stuff around the world. And the operations of the quartermaster corps and the supply chains in military operations are just staggeringly enormous. Uh, the object of this study was to insert a right-sized force with the right suite of weapons and equipment at the right place and time, to do things smarter and to accomplish things. Well, 
we might ask ourselves, why would we care about this? In entrepreneur uh, lingo, we ask uh, potential startups, well, what happens if you win? Right? When we win, what do we get? What's the prize? Somebody might answer that question immediately with a direct and obvious kind of success metric saying, well, we're going to save the Defense Department a lot of dollars. That's not a bad reason to deploy a technology, but it's not the only reason that you could think of why a technology might make a big difference, not only to the performance of the Defense Department, but also the world. It also saves a lot of people's time and, we hope, saves a lot of lives, which are something that's very difficult to measure in terms of dollars. An unobvious benefit is, of course, we'd like to believe that every military operation has a mission. And accomplishing this mission would be a good thing. This is where some of the ideology might come in. But if we're going to accomplish it, we'd like for it to be accomplished quickly and effectively. Right? That could be a big change. Even if it cost exactly the same, even if it took, took exactly the same amount of person hours, even if the risk to human life and limb were the same, being able to actually accomplish the goals 95% of the time instead of accomplishing them 85% of the time would be a big plus. And then finally, the indirect and unobvious result of this you could imagine that an armed services which was faster and stronger and cheaper wouldn't have to be used as much, right? Being able to react, to spin on a dime, if you will, to react instantaneously would mean that you could have a longer period of time of not using military force, right? Whether for a negotiation or sanctions or whatever, because you knew that you were always going to be able to get troops to wherever you need them in 24 hours. It would give you longer before you actually had to start building them up. So I'd encourage you to think about these indirect and non-obvious implications of these technologies that we're talking about. It's one thing to say, well, I could put a chip into my cell phone so that I could press a button and it would call me and tell me where it was. Right? But I want you to think past that of just saying, gee, I would never leave my cell phone at home anymore. I'd ask you to think about what would that do to the cell phone replacement industry? What would that do to the idea that you have to have two copies of everything, one for your home and one for your office? Think about these non-obvious implications. One key metaphor which came up a couple of times in our discussion uh, was the invention of the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Uh, those of us who were in our 30s remember these television commercials quite clearly where you have you know, two people jogging along, one of whom is eating a candy bar, one of whom has a jar of peanut butter, and why you would go jogging with a bar, jar of peanut butter, I will never know. But they run into each other, and one person says, hey, you, know, you got chocolate on my peanut butter, and the other person says, hey, you got peanut butter on my chocolate. They each try it. Goodness knows why they were persuaded to do this. And they said, hey, this is great. And the tagline was, two great tastes that go great together, Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Some of you are humming along as I speak. That's sort of the metaphor for this conference, is trying to figure out what these tastes are which go great together. Each of these capabilities individually are really interesting to think about, but I firmly believe that killer applications come at the intersection of these capabilities. And so you might want to ask yourself, you know, what happens if we develop two or more of these at the same time? What's going to arise that we haven't thought about yet, which is going to be the 21st century equivalent of the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup? Thank you.